and welcome to my channel, Haley Marie Vintage. Today I'm really excited about today's project. Spoiler alert, it is another gown. I don't know what's gotten into me, but I just keep wanting to make gowns and I have a bunch of fabric in my stash devoted to gown making. Let's talk pattern first. This is a Lady Marlowe pattern. I believe it's a 1940s pattern. It's a evening dress, 3417. I chose this pattern because I like the like butt bustle that's going on back here and kind of the lines happening here and I thought it would be absolutely beautiful. So with this pattern in mind, when I went to Thailand, I looked for silk to make this in. So I was able to pick up a good yardage of silk that for silk was fairly affordable. Not cheap, don't get me wrong, but more affordable for silk. So that is what I'm gonna be using today. But before I use that, I'm first gonna do a mock-up using this kind of fun, funky fall fabric. It has like these little leaves on it that are super cute. I'm gonna make a mock-up because obviously I don't want to cut into my silk until I know this fits and this has quite a few different lines that I might want to make fit a little bit better. So I'm gonna first make it out of this which I have seven and five eighths yards of. I'm going to make the full length of this dress in this and then I likely will cut it off and make it kind of more like a mid calf length or a knee length dress so that way it's more practical for every day. And then after that I'm going to use this gorgeous silk. I have this silk folded in on the shiny side. Here's the shiny side. It's really lustrous. It's gorgeous. It's not sheer. I would actually say it's fairly similar feeling to like the taffeta from Silk Baron and I think this was closer to $20 a yard as opposed to like $30, $40 a yard. This would have normally been in the States. I grabbed it because I absolutely love the color and the color itself also just reminds me of Thailand. And then I've just really enjoyed picking up fabrics on my travels to make garments out of and this is going to be one really, really special dress. I'm feeling pretty excited about this project but also a little nervous. Like usual, I won't do much of the mock-up on camera. I'll do the mock-up, show you you my fit issues and then I'll show you how I adjust those fit issues. You'll really mostly see me working on this silk. It's also extra important for me to make a mock-up of this because kind of a more satiny silk often will show a lot of flaws. If you have to unpick a lot of times you're gonna see all those needle marks so it's really important to make a mock-up with silk because in that mock-up you can then do all that unpicking and picking and figure out exactly how you want everything to work and it gives you a test trial of the project so that way Way you're less likely to make the mistakes that you have to unpick on the silk. This will be my second silk dress this year and you will see a third for Halloween, uh, spoiler alert. But after that I'm kind of off my, I think I really need to be done making gowns for a while because I don't live a gown life but I make a lot of gowns because they're really really fun and interesting. So this will be my I think second to last gown of the year and then we'll start going into winter after Halloween where I will not be doing gowns. So enjoy this gown video while the gown videos are going and let's go ahead and hop into my mock-up process and me showing you some of the different things I'm doing there. First things first, because this is a reproduction pattern, I have to cut out the pattern pieces. This always takes a while and is my least favorite part of a task. But this is why I buy pre-printed is because what I hate even more than this is putting all the PDF patterns together. So while I hate this part, I at least didn't have to tape it together to start with. I also have to keep a sharp eye on Spooky because she loves to chew on paper. To start, I'm gonna cut out the pattern just normally without too many adjustments. The only adjustment I've made here is I've shortened it by six inches because usually that's about how long, too long like patterns are for me if I want them to be floor length. So that is what I'm starting with. And that's why you see that like big weird triangle gap thing that I'm trying to fill in there. And yes, to note, this is my mock-up fabric. Obviously, this is not the silk. I will not cut into silk unless I've done a mock-up first. This will just be a simple wearable mock-up. My mock-up's done. It's only taken me three hours. As you can see by these horizontal lines, I do need a little bit more ease in the stomach. That's gonna be pretty easy. I think I'm just gonna add an extra inch here where the back buttons are because I have like some gathering here, so that feels pretty easy. So that's kind of the only fit adjustment I think I'll make. I guess this technically isn't hitting me under the bust. So I might see if I can figure out how to lengthen this by just a smidge. I actually like otherwise how the bodice fits. And then you can't see the hem, but the hem is about 
The hem is perfect for this dress, which is what I designed it for with it bringing it up by six inches. I think I need to bring it back down by at least two inches, if not three. I'm gonna do that because I do want this silk gown to be like proper evening attire. So I am gonna plan to do that. But yeah, this looks really, really good. Yeah, it only took me three hours and 45 minutes to make. Granted, this is not fully finished. I still need to do all the finishings as well as the closure. But honestly, I have definitely found that 1930s and 40s evening gowns are fairly easy patterns. Honestly, for me, part of the like big time suck on patterns is often gathering. And while these do have quite a bit of gathering up here, here and back here they don't take that long so i'm feeling pretty optimistic but yeah i definitely need at least an inch here i might even give myself an inch and a half in theory that probably expands the back a little bit more i guess i could maybe slash and spread this i'm gonna think about the different ways to do this and i'm sure i will update you when i cut the fabric tomorrow because yeah i just i do need definitely at least an inch if not an inch and a half especially because i think with the teal one i want to do a proper button close this one where the closure is I'm gonna go ahead and put in a zipper that's gonna give me that extra bit of width I need right here so I'm gonna go ahead and do that but I do want it to be proper button-up back thing I'm I'm pleased and I think this will be a cute little fall outfit uh, with the little leaves and apples on it so the rest of tonight I am eating some food and chilling but tomorrow I will get started on the real deal I am adding the tiniest bit of shape to the shoulder to give me hopefully it hitting a little bit lower on my bust line. But that is what I'm doing here with this adjustment. And then otherwise, I am pretty much cutting out the pattern normally. And then, of course, I am adding just, I think, about a half inch to that back panel that was going a little tight. But otherwise, I did this pretty straightforward. I know a lot of people cut their silk pieces individually because it's slippery. I'm too lazy for that and not that precise of a cutter. So I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. And then we have now reached the point in the video where I like to remind you that I have a Kofi where you can go over and buy me a coffee if you so desire. I put a lot of time and money into this channel so i always really appreciate it when people buy me a coffee and then the last thing i am doing here is cutting bias strips i'm going to use these bias strips to bind some seams and it's also specified that i'm going to need bias strips to do the finishings on the sleeves or i guess lack of sleeves first things first i am putting a nice crisp line on all the parts of this that have that fold over element. This will just help me keep everything aligned. And you'll notice here that I did cut right along the selvage so that way I didn't have to finish this edge and could be a little bit lazier. Also selvage edge is best finish in my opinion because it's really flat. And one of the first steps is putting in the gathers for the shoulders. As you can see, my tension is way too tight here. I couldn't quite figure out how to fix it. This has been an ongoing issue and I am going to take in my machine soon to try to get it to work. Since I last got it serviced, my tension while doing a gathering seam is just not working the way it used to. I eventually got the basting to work a little bit better by messing with the tension, but yeah, something's just a little bit up with my machine here. One of the interesting things about this dress is actually all these seams aren't really sewn necessarily by like the classic right sides together method, but are instead sewed by folding it over and then top stitching it down, which you'll see what I mean here. Here I've folded and then I have pressed these lines. And then what I'm gonna do after that is I'm gonna pin the piece that attaches to it on top of this, and then I will actually stitch it from the top, which you'll see in a second. Here is what I mean by stitching it from the top. So this is just a different type of seaming, and I'm not gonna lie, I really struggle with this type of seaming because it feels really hard to finish the seams. So if you have any finished Finishing seam advice for stuff like this let me know because you can't like French seam it or do anything like that. But after I am sewing I'm then pulling out all the gathering stitches. And then for the seam finishing I'm doing like a quick bias bind. That was just the only thing that made sense to me but it only makes sense in certain places where it's okay to have that little extra bit of bulk like the top of the shoulders. And then when it's all done I am pressing it and then it looks like this. And so it's a very very nice seam. I just like would really like to know how to finish these seams without a ton of extra bulk in them. And then here I am setting up the seam that's like on the back that goes to like the main middle panel with all the buttons. So that is what's going on here. 
So with me having those three main bodice panels together, it is time for me to sew in the sleeve bias tape. So this bias tape is how you finish all the sleeve holes and they have you do it at this point, which I did not do in my mock-up because then when you go to sew your bodice pieces together, it makes a really nice like circular sleeve fitting thing. Here I do want to know, I have changed how I do these bias facings in the sleeve. In the past, I did it without pins, but I recently watched a video by, I'm pretty sure it's Tasha can make that. I'm going to link it down below where she described how she makes successful bias bindings in round things. And she uses a lot of pins and like really eases it in. So that way when you double fold it over, there's enough fabric and it doesn't do that weird tight thing that armholes do. I am also now clipping where that bias finishing is. That was another thing I learned from the video. I thought you couldn't really clip a ton when it came to bias, but turns out you can. And then here I am, of course, understitching. Like I always say, it is the correct way to go because it will get your facing laying nice and flat. And then with that done, I'm going to press my armhole. I'm pressing this while it's still pretty flat, so that way it is as easy as possible. And then here I'm attaching the side bodice seam. I forgot to set this one up for being a French seam, so this is actually going to be a bias bound seam. And then I am stitching that down with a very snuggly spooky. With it getting a little cooler out, she wants to be closer to me, but also she loves silk, much to my dismay. So if there's silk around, she wants to be on it. I am also sewing the like folded over facing neck and back bits here with that similar invisible-ish stitch. Now it is time to pin the seams together for the skirt. I'm working on the front first, which consists of that main fabric with the triangle up at that top. That will be right under my bust, and then the two side panels get sewn to that. So I'm working on those two side panels and they're a little bit tricky because there's almost like a rectangle shape there. You'll see what I'm talking about when I actually do the reveal. It's a really flattering line, but it's a little tricky to sew because you're kind of turning a corner with knot, which you can see this by where I have clipped the fabric. One of that is like the triangle inset quarter and the other isn't. Again, hopefully this is all making sense. It's very hard to explain because it was very strange to do. This took a lot of trying to get it right on the mock-up, but basically I have the corner clipped so that way I can just sew it all in one straight line and everything falls as it should. This one I was not able to cut with a French seam in mind, so I'm also going to be doing a bias bound seam here. Here you can see me sewing up to where that like clipping happened. So I'm actually like back stitching here to make sure it's extra secure. These are usually points of stress that it's really easy for a garment to tear at. And so I just wanna make sure it's really reinforced and I'm a little bit turning the fabric for it to have that kind of corner shape as you saw there. And then I'm making sure also to have my stitches on the side of the clipping so there's no little hole that develops there. That is something I actually did with my mock-up. And then here I am attaching this bias binding. I'm not concerned with the bulk here because this is a very flowy dress. So I just wanna make sure my seams are covered. I will say normally I won't individually like fold this to figure it out but the silk is so slippery that I do find myself having to fold this twice and then pin it to make sure that these stay nice and even because otherwise it's slick and I sometimes don't get that double turn to really have fully clean seams inside. Here is me doing that final stitching and I'm going to repeat the same thing for the back panels. All right, good morning. I have been hard at work on this dress. I'm getting pretty excited. I think I be, will be able to wrap everything today except for probably buttons. I'm feeling very conflicted about buttons, so I'm gonna take a poll over on Instagram on what people's thoughts are, because yes, I, I'm having a hard time. I was gonna use a pre-made button loop, but I think I'm gonna make my own button loops even though it's gonna take a gajillion years. This is a dress that's special enough for it. So far, this has gone really, really smoothly. I always say that's because of a mock-up. I don't know, I feel like mock-ups help a lot. Ooh, yummy. I'm moving a little slower than I want today right now just because I am very, very sore. I went paddle boarding and perhaps my body is not in the best shape to go paddle boarding right now. So I'm having just like a lot of hip pain right now and some back pain, but it was worth it. I had so much fun with my friends and I have just sometimes a harder time leaving the house these days. And so it's always really good when I do, but I am definitely like, 
having the consequences of my decisions now. But let me show you my dresses in four pieces. Let me get the tee far away from here because obviously because this is silk, it will water stain. So I have two pieces here that each are, this is the front of the bodice and then this is the back. I did realize I forgot to do, there's like a little indent here, but with all the seam binding and it being silk, I'm not gonna unpick that. But yes, I have my two halves of bodice. And then right now this skirt is in halves. I have basically the front to the side back right here. And then the other panel I have here is what needs to have gathering stitches in it. So I'll probably start by putting in the gathering stitches. What's left shouldn't take that long. So I took a lot of care in easing my skirt so everything would end up the same length at the bottom, hoping to keep the dress evenly length so I don't need help hemming it. I'm hoping to get it to the point where I could have help hemming it by this afternoon. I have, I have a group of friends. I just, I kind of want to talk about this for a second. We call it queer education you can do it without queer people. Like as we start to look at what hopefully a less capitalist society looks like, part of that is community building and skill sharing. So what my group, uh, once a month, uh, we have a group of people that get together and somebody teaches a skill they have. I've taught darning, I've taught mending. Today we're doing dyeing. Next next month we're doing knife sharpening. <laughs> um, so just really diverse. We've done like putting together an emergency backpack. So if something happens, you have something to take and go. So we have all that and I just I think it's a really cool thing that we do and I would highly recommend if you have a group of friends just getting together and sharing skills everybody has skills to share we've talked about financial literacy I'm going to teach another class on pine needle basket weaving and I'm also going to probably do another mending class because those are always really successful because people come in and um, leave with garments that are now usable for them again I might do at some point some like minor alteration classes I, I don't know I feel like you're watching this channel you're fairly craftsy likely even if you don't sew you probably do something and it's really important to share those skills within our communities and that's like a huge part of um, kind of moving away from capitalism is being able to do these skills ourselves um, and sharing them with each other so that's just something I really enjoy that's what I'm going to later this afternoon and if I can get this dress done before I go if I need help hemming it I have a friend there who can help even out the hem for me so that is why I guess that was relevant, that little uh, side, side step. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. This dress has gone really smoothly. If you are like scared of, I would say 1930s eras, don't be. So far compared to a lot of dresses I make, 1930s era stuff has been way easier than some of the 40s and 50s stuff I've done. So it's something to consider. Of course, you have to buy reproduction patterns. You can't really buy original. But yeah, I'm feeling pretty excited and I do think I'm gonna be able to wrap this up before I go uh, to my dyeing class. So we're gonna do that. Here I am sewing up all the back skirt panels and these I am again doing that bias binding because I'm not concerned with the bulk of it except for at my waist. One of the things I have to do there is basically the bottom of this seam here is what will be the top stitching method that I showed you earlier on those gathered panels that hang off the butt. So I'm first just making sure to have it really pinned securely where these meet because these are two separate pieces essentially, right? And with that secured, I'm now running the gathering stitches into the panels that they apply to here, which is just the back two ones. And then I am gathering those up to fit and pinning that down. And then I'm top stitching that down like usual. And after that, I will be binding it the way I have been. Again, here, I'm not concerned about bulk. There's already so many gathers here that there's gonna be some bulk that will perfectly hide the fact that I bias bound the seam. And now what I'm doing here is I am basting down the edge that is going to connect to the bodice. So this is the edge with like the triangle at the front and all the other things. This dress is honestly really hard to show you how I sewed. So hopefully this video makes sense at all. This was a very, very strange construction style and it was quite fun to learn how to do it, but it did mean that I feel like I didn't communicate the most clearly that I could have. After basting it, I am pressing it down. And also before basting it, I do wanna know I had actually finished the edge with just a fold over stitch. That was kind of my attempt at a solution to figure out how to finish the waist seam with low bulk, but this did leave the gathered bits on elbow to be finished. So again, give me your tips on how you would have finished these knowing how it's constructed. Now I'm going around and I am pinning this to the rest of the bodice 
which basically is where like the side seams meet to where the armholes are and then again that triangle with the gathers that will be over um, the bodice again such a weird dress I don't know how to explain and then I'm top stitching that very very carefully it's imperative here that I don't accidentally run off the either two pieces of fabric here because there's going to be a lot of tension here since this seam is basically the waist seam across the dress and then of course I am pulling out those gathering stitches a lot of people choose not to use gathering stitches on silk because silk satin will show every stitch I don't find it's too bad where the gathers are just purely because where the gathers are there's so much volume that people are probably not looking for those little holes and honestly given where those gathers are located if they are that is a whole different problem than them noticing those holes and then after a quick try on i realized very quickly that i wanted those darts back in the back because i had indeed made it wide enough for those darts to be viable and they were looking quite stretched and baggy without them so i am trying to like retroactively mark these with my paper this worked well enough but you know i kind of wish i had known i was going to add in the darts before i did this and then after those are marked i'm going to pin them and then sew them the next thing to figure out are the buttons. I headed on to Instagram to have you guys take a poll on the buttons because I could not make a decision for the life of me. So you guys helped me make a good decision in Instagram, so now I'm finally putting them down. And what I am doing is I'm using my button gauge to evenly space out the buttons. I have eight buttons, so that is what these are spaced for. We have reached the time of the year where it gets dark a little bit earlier out. So I am stitching in the dark and here I am sewing on those sparkly sparkly buttons. I quite like these and I'm really happy that you guys helped me decide on them. And then what I am doing for my button trim, I guess, they t instruct you to use like braided button loop, but that limits the size of your buttons and it was much too small in my opinion, the button loop that I had on hand for this dress and what I wanted to do. So I decided to instead make these like the old school way, which is using thread where I am going to be poking out the thread, wrapping it around a few times to the size it would fit a button. And then after that, I'll be using kind of like a buttonhole stitch to make the actual like thicker buttonhole itself. You can see the other two I've already completed up above. If I can, I'll try to find a tutorial on how to do this um, because this is not going to be an adequate information for you guys. But this tends to be how I do my button loops anytime I'm adding a button to like a high tension point where it almost needs to act like more of a hook and eye. I sometimes will do these up at the top of like a blouse or something in the back because I just think this is a really, really beautiful hand detail finish and it's one of the reasons I sew is so I can do things by hand like this. With the buttons on and tested it was finally time for me to hem it and I got the length for this about perfect. I didn't have to really cut off any hem and I learned from my mock-up where I made a really wonky hem because I didn't like ease the pieces into each other. So I did ease the pieces into each other on this dress and I didn't have to do much leveling because it does go down pretty long in the back but that's the way I like it and you will see that in the reveal which is right now and I hope you really enjoy the reveal. This dress was so cool to make. seen the reveal I hope you enjoyed it it required a lot of socializing for me because the owner of the home was out he did give me a tour of his dahlias which was really nice they're along the side fence which I always enjoy a dahlia tour I think dahlias are very cool flowers but yes it was more social than I intended I usually go out 
hoping to not encounter people on these. Do tell him, I think his name was Dan, that he has a very nice garden. He was very worried about the fact that some of his flowers were dead, even though it's like the end of September. His, I thought his yard looked great. That was very reassuring, but you know. I get it. Uh, when you're a garden person, when your garden is, on, is not at its peak, you maybe want to show it off a little bit less. Anyway, uh, we're going to go ahead and go into wrap up. So first I'm going to start with the cost breakdown and then I'll talk about the dress itself. So for the cost breakdown, all things considered, not terribly priced considering this is 100% silk that is not see-through at all. The fabric was $158, even though it was seven and a quarter yards. And this, I just think it's because I bought it in Thailand. So typically fabric like this, like really thick satin, Silk in the US would probably be around like $30 to $50 a yard, but because I was in Thailand, I was closer to the source, so I think it was significantly cheaper. I actually kind of wish I bought a second yardage, maybe for like a blouse, but too late, obviously, although I hope to go back to Bangkok someday. But yeah, so that was the price of the fabric, which while expensive, is fairly cheap for seven yards of silk. For notions, notions on this was relatively low. It was just the buttons and the thread, which brought me to a total of $9.63. This also took less thread because there was no gathering. And the pattern, I halved it because I made this dress with it, so I've used it twice technically. Now I'm fussing with this dress. So the pattern was $14.42. I'll have the pattern linked down below since it's a Lady Marlowe reproduction. You can totally access it super easily. So that brings us to a supply total of $182.05. And honestly, considering the fact this is a silk evening gown, I think that's a great price for that. I think this is like an instant of sewing saving you money. And this is still an expensive dress but obviously a hello spooky oh yeah oh so spooky boo okay mm, that's on the silk I don't know about that oh just child let me hope this is still recording if not you're about to get some funky audio okay this is still recording spooky boo okay I think she's about to leave me finally but yeah I think that's not bad for a silk evening gown I do think all things considered, silk evening gowns are really expensive. It's hard to find real silk nowadays. So I do, I think this is cheaper than if you were to buy it from a retailer, which is not always true in sewing. However, let's start to get into labor. This gown took me 12 hours, which is interesting because the mock-up only took me eight hours and 45 minutes, but this one took me 12. I think it's because I French seamed it and I was also just moving slowly because I was trying to not ruin anything because it's silk. And I also, I think, had to do those size adjustments in it from this mock-up to that dress. But as always, gonna give my little labor spiel. I think everybody deserves, I actually saw this recently, instead of calling it a living wage, a thrivable wage, which means that you can afford your basic needs and then also a little bit plus some for entertainment and things like that. We live in a world that there are more than enough resources for everybody to live a good life. We can feed everybody, we can house everyone, we can clothe everyone and everybody can be entertained. We just don't because of the hoarding of wealth by billionaires. So like this is totally a doable thing in modern society. We could totally pay everyone. However, most garment workers are not paid even a living wage, let alone a thrivable wage. As a result, garments are really, really cheap. So just to bring awareness, even though this is not a one-to-one -one with a factory, obviously I'm a seamstress without the cool tools at home. I'm not factory line, but that 12 hours by $32.70 would be $392.40 for labor. So that would bring you to a grand total of $574.45. For this dress, if I was to sell it with no profit, nothing built in, usually if you're gonna build in profit, you want about 60%, so then you can mark it down if you need to. So you would be looking at over a $1,000 dress retail for this guy. If I was to sell it, just because usually when I'm getting rid of something, it's because it doesn't fit. This is how much clothing should be worth. And actually, when you look comparatively, like if you look at clothes priced in the 40s and the 50s inflated now, they would actually cost in the hundreds per garment. It's why people had less expansive wardrobe. Back in the 50s and the 60s, we had quite a strong garment workers union here in the US. So that is my labor spiel. That is the money spiel. Hopefully you enjoy that. I always enjoy sharing these numbers with you. It is a little bit uncomfortable to be this transparent about money, but I think it's super helpful. I look at projects and I wonder how much people spend and like what's doable for me and stuff like that. So hopefully this helps. And you could always, of course, do this with a polyester satin if you're on a budget or you can do it in not the satin like this dress and then you have a nice little like fancy feeling day dress. But let's talk about the dress itself, which I do have here. Oh, Spooky finally abandoned me. It's inside out from the reveal yesterday. 
so here it is it is beautiful the inside is also beautiful it's all french seamed there's only one seam that i couldn't quite figure out how to finish and that's the waist seam because i was trying not to add bulk of a binding so if you have ideas on how i can finish that let me know the like non-gathered edge is finished but the gathered edge doesn't finish because again if i like fold it over that would add bulk so i just was a little bit mystified overall though i really like the fit adjustments i made to this dress it is a lot easier and comfier and i was able to still have the darts in it while it also being big enough around my midsection. I actually thought it would be helpful to show you guys this one. So I dropped this a little bit lower on that one, which I do still appreciate, but I still think the bust on the this one doesn't fit 100% correctly, which is totally fine. It, I'm gonna say it happens. That's not necessarily the phrasing I'm looking for because what I was gonna say is I also don't know if this is actually supposed to go all the way under your cup because if it did that on me, that would put the point of the diamonds like here-ish and that feels really, really low for the 1930s. So I am curious if it is actually supposed to cut across kind of like it does. Uh, give me your opinion. Um, I'm curious on your best opinion of the fit. I won't take any offense. Uh, it's also interesting because I was looking at the photographs of this dress and I really like the way the bust fits in the mirror, but it doesn't photograph well. So that might just be another weird aspect. I don't know. Um, I'm always learning things. I'm always trying things with these. I will say, I don't know that I think I'll make this dress again, mainly because I do think while this day dress version of it turned out really cute and it, it was really comfortable. I've been wearing it all day. I've eaten in it it is a plus for me while it's really comfortable I don't know how much I like it in a day dress compared to the gown like I think this is much prettier in gown form and admittedly if I'm gonna spend the money on fabric to make a gown I'm probably not making a duplicate pattern so yeah I don't know that I'll use this again however I do think if you like the silhouette making this in a daytime fabric and layering it with a turtleneck like this totally makes this a wearable piece for daytime even if you love the lines and you have nowhere to wear like a gown to I highly recommend the pattern for that overall I'm really proud of my work here I I actually don't think besides the unfinished waist seam that I would change anything about it. I really like the buttons I chose. Thank you to Instagram people who I took a poll on Instagram. Those are always really helpful. You can follow me over there if you want to help me with real time on some projects. I'm trying to decide at the end of September here. Actually, I think the day this video goes live that evening is called Seattle Frocktails, which is where a bunch of sewists get together wearing dresses they made kind of for like a little gala evening thing. So I'm trying to decide what gown I'm wearing to this. This is definitely a contender because it's super comfy. I'm kind of waiting on weather because I'm debating wearing my other 1930s silk dress, which that one is best if it's going to be really hot. But if it's going to be really cold, this one might be better or honestly a different gown entirely. So I don't know yet what I am going to wear to that, but I'm really excited for it and I'm excited to have this done in time. And I am really pleased with what I made this silk into. I think it worked really well since this is a special piece of silk for me since it is from my trip to Thailand. And the other thing, I rediscovered hair combs, which is how I have my hair up right now, which hair combs is actually my preferred way to have my hair like back and out of my face. So I ordered a few new vintage ones that I'm super excited about. I like was picking through my drawer to figure out how exactly I was gonna fix the headpiece I wore for the reveal. If you have just like a hard time figuring out how to get your hair out of your face, highly recommend a comb. But with that, we're gonna wrap this up. As always, you can support me over on my Ko-Fi by buying me a coffee if you desire. I always really appreciate it as the labor that I put into these videos as well, as well as the supply material is nowhere near made up by the $25 I maybe make for video on YouTube. Although I should check, that's probably gone up in the last month. I might be at $35 a video, but regardless, that does not cover really much more than the cost of the pattern and the notions in most of these. And of course, you can always support me the free ways by liking this video and commenting down below and then definitely subscribe and stick around if you enjoyed this video. I post every single Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time and I would love to see you then and I will see you next time. Bye!